During a recent Middle East heat wave, these Israeli fitness fanatics are competing in a marathon cycle contest right outside Jerusalem's ancient Jaffa Gate. They're peddling furiously day and night to win prizes. Well, here at the Jerusalem Channel, we're also peddling as fast as we can, figuratively speaking, to keep up with the ever-expanding demand to watch our video teachings about the Holy Land, Israel and prophecy, and the Hebrew roots of our faith. With our recently added free mobile app, viewers around the world can watch and listen on their mobile phones and tablets. But all this video streaming comes at a price. Whether you're talking about megabytes, gigabytes, or even terabytes to provide high quality video to a global audience. That's why we need your help to meet a challenge of $30,000. With that goal, we plan to expand into several new video streams, specializing in topics that will be a blessing to you. So please help us to run the race with your gift. Just click the donate button on our website to give by credit or debit card. Or write to us at Box 2768, Stanton, Virginia, zip code 24402, where American donors can receive a tax-deductible acknowledgement. And in the UK, we can claim gift aid on your donation. Send it to Box 109, Hereford, HR4 9XR England. Thanks for being a part of the Jerusalem Channel Outreach. The Jerusalem Channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching. One of the greatest soul winners of our generation is Billy Graham. Although he touched thousands and millions of lives around the world, Dr. Graham himself admitted that if he had his life to live all over again, he would want definitely to put more emphasis on the cost of discipleship. But what is that cost? I want to explain. Hello, I'm Christine Darg. We were recently in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we toured the fascinating Billy Graham Library. The museum was very nostalgic for me because the preaching of Billy Graham has been part of the backdrop of my life. We enjoyed rambling through the memorabilia. I especially enjoyed visiting a replica of one of Billy's early gospel tents. The museum's exit room is a theater to watch Graham give an altar call, and where we were dutifully presented with a decision card for Jesus. There was just no way that visitors are going to leave the building without having an opportunity to get saved. In the West, where we've enjoyed a lot of religious freedom, Christianity, especially American Christianity, however, has degenerated into what might be called an easy gospel. Just believe in Jesus. Not too many demands of anything else are made. What about baptism, regeneration, sanctification, and leading a holy life for the Lord? Aren't we supposed to be born again, radically transformed? What is the genuine gospel? Well, in the Great Commission in Luke 24, Jesus said, when you go to preach, the subject should be that the Hebrew prophecies were fulfilled about the Messiah's suffering and rising from the dead on the third day. And he said to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. He also said signs and wonders would confirm the truth of the gospel. So Jesus said, you're going to start in Jerusalem and go the world over with this message that people can be forgiven of their sins in the name of Jesus if they choose to turn around and repent. He said you're going to start where you are and keep preaching far and wide. And if they persecute you in one place, move on. Don't waste your time arguing and casting your gospel pearls before swine and swindlers. If you're rejected, 
Knock the dust off your feet. Move on and find somebody else who will listen. If you're mocked, find somebody else to pray for. Now, Jesus also carefully cautioned his followers to count the cost of becoming his disciples. For example, in Luke 14, we have a scenario of huge crowds traveling around with Jesus. But he turned to these hordes and said that they'd have to meet certain qualifications if they wanted to be his true disciples. This makes me think of a leader in the Hebrew Bible named Gideon, one of the judges who led tens of thousands. But God said that some of his men had to be eliminated because of fear. Out of 10,000 remaining, most weren't vigilant enough. Their carelessness disqualified them. In the end, Gideon's band was whittled down to only 300. So now in the New Testament, we see Jesus with thousands of people following him. But he says to the crowd some pretty startling things. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person, Jesus said, cannot be my disciple. Wow, the word hate sounds incredibly harsh. But Jesus didn't mean hate in the sense of despising your loved ones. He used hate as a Hebrew idiom for preference. He's asking for nothing less than the whole heart. Because, you know, the heart can't be given by halves. So Jesus' disciples must be willing to abandon family and their own plans if asked to do so. And then he added, And whoever doesn't carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. You see, in Jesus' day, the cross wasn't a piece of jewelry. It was a form of execution, and the condemned person had to carry his own cross beam. The Lord further explained the cost of discipleship. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete the tower? Because if you don't finish it, everyone will ridicule, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Well, the Christian landscape is strewn with half-built towers. That's the observation of John Stott, the late Anglican clergyman and evangelical leader. Stott wrote that the Christian landscape is strewn with a wreckage of many derelict half-built towers. He said thousands, and I would dare say millions, still ignore the Lord's warning and undertake to follow him without first pausing to consider the costs. The result of such carelessness is the great scandal of nominal Christianity. There's a whole world of people who need to hear the true gospel, and many of them are sitting in the churches. But fake, easy Christianity isn't the only scandal in the church world today. I'd like to mention at least two other scandals in our end-time churches. And these scandals are the lack of real faith to believe all the promises of God in this holy book. And equally scandalous is the neglect of Bible prophecy. In fact, ignorance of Bible prophecy is all the more scandalous today because we're living in the culmination of great prophetic events foretold in the Bible. And the church should be awake to what's going on in Bible prophecy. The scandal of not believing the promises of God is due to the sad reality that most unbelieving believers try to explain away the magnificent faith promises available to all of us in this Bible. Our unbelief is a great scandal and affront to the Lord. He said, we have not because we ask not. And we ask not often because we don't have the faith to ask. Now let's look in the New Testament in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, where Jesus described three characteristics of genuine disciples. And these paint a different picture of today's typical churchgoer. He said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him first deny himself. Secondly, let him take up his cross daily 
And then number three characteristic, Jesus said, follow me. In most churches in the West, self-denial and daily cross-bearing aren't popular sermon titles. You're much more likely to hear a message on chasing your dream or trying to tap into God's glory. The main theme of Western Christianity seems to be all you have to do to be saved is just believe in Jesus. Dear Jesus, please forgive my sin and keep me from hell. But faith in Jesus is more than fire insurance. In reality, Jesus taught, if you want to follow me, you have to count the cost. You have to take up your cross daily and you have to deny yourself. You have to obey me. You have to follow me. My word must abide in you and you must keep my word. You see, obedience is his requirement. In fact, he said in Matthew 7, 21, something that I think is quite terrifying. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So lordship isn't a casual commitment. Jesus says it's going to be the doers, not just those who give lip service, who will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, I know some of you will argue on that point. After all, this is the 500th year of the Reformation, the move of God that recovered the truth that it's by grace that we're saved through faith, the doctrine of sola fide, justification by faith alone. Salvation is the gift of God, lest any man should boast about his works. Yet the New Testament also teaches that faith without works is dead. So all in all, the gospel is a call to follow the Lord obediently day after day by faith. Salvation is not just a one-time stroll down the sawdust trail of the revival meeting to make a decision for Jesus. It's not just a signature on a decision card. It's a commitment to obey until the end. So it's surely a gospel scandal when sinners are told that if they want to be saved and go to heaven, all they need to do is accept Jesus. I've never really liked that word, that verb, accept, when it comes to the Lord Jesus. People are advised, just accept him as Lord and Savior, as if by accepting him, you're doing him a big favor. You're doing Jesus an honor. A much better invitation is to receive the Lord, receive the Savior into our hearts, into our lives, into our destinies and wills, because salvation encompasses a lot more than mental assent just to accept Jesus. In his book, Christ's Call to Discipleship, Jim Boyce wrote that in good times, the cost of discipleship doesn't seem very high. In times of prosperity, there's the temptation to become a nominal Christian without actually undergoing the radical transformation that a true conversion implies. In countries where Christian civilization has spread, large numbers of people have covered themselves with a thin veneer of Christianity. They have allowed themselves to become somewhat involved in the Lord's work, enough for them to look decent or respectable, but their lives aren't genuinely transformed. And that's why cynics dismiss nominal Christians as hypocrites. But Boyce noted that in the days of adversity and persecution, those who become Christians count the cost of discipleship carefully before taking up the cross of the Nazarene. Amen. Well, Christians in the Middle East and those suffering in the regimes of dictators don't need the message of cross-bearing hammered home. More Christians today are reportedly being martyred for their faith than in the history of the church. They know the cost and they're paying the price. For them, they've already purchased the pearl of great price, the Savior, and they experience the fellowship of the Lord's suffering. Well, what did Jesus actually command us to do? He said, go into all the world and make what? disciples. He didn't say make believers because even the demons believe in the Lord. 
and they tremble. A disciple is different from a believer. The word disciple implies discipline and practice. Discipline and self-denial, discipline and never giving up when we're hated, persecuted, and rejected. Discipline and carrying our individual crosses cheerfully. Despite the personal costs, the invitation is still open to everybody. This is because Jesus did say, if anyone wishes to come after me, and if anyone wishes or so choose, then let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus is saying to everybody in all cultures everywhere, you want to be my true follower? Then there are going to be certain qualifications. You're going to have to die to self. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. And that saying means that the invitation is open to the many, but in actuality, few are willing to count the cost and decide to be chosen. A life of following Jesus is a life of sacrifice, but it's also a life of adventure. To me, following the Lord is an adventure because of supernatural guidance and answers to prayer. But the hordes who are ambitious to make money or who don't want to leave the comforts of home aren't necessarily going to buy into it. How many mega churches do you know really teach self-denial, bearing our crosses, and agreeing to follow Jesus into the unknown? Well, if we don't repent of our nominal Christianity in the West, someday soon when the judge, the king of kings, returns, many professing Christians will cry out, why did the churches lie to us? Why didn't you tell us the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Right now, few pulpits are willing to teach the truth about God's Word. Instead, many preachers are held captive by a spirit of fear. They're afraid they'll be mocked or marginalized as extremists. They fear losing their financial support. George Barna is a well-known American researcher. He's founder of the Barna Group. According to his research, an overwhelming 90% of conservative evangelical pastors will not preach about controversial issues such as abortion, same-sex marriage, politics, Bible prophecy. A survey conducted by George Barna polled clergy members anonymously to get their forthright responses. And I fact-checked the source and discovered that Barna had indeed compiled information over a two-year period to monitor the theological and political views of conservative pastors. When polled about the key issues of the day, the majority of the conservative ministers, and remember, we're talking about conservatives, not liberals, 90% admitted that the Bible does address every current issue. But when asked, are you teaching your people about what the Bible says on these issues? Less than 10% said that they're willing to speak about the key issues. We must pray into this for change. Isn't it time for pastors to stand up and speak up? Conservative evangelicals were asked, how often do you preach on subjects such as Bible prophecy, abortion, the temptations of deviant sex, and the things that are driving our culture. And 90% said, we never talk about these things from our pulpits. If we speak about controversy, things such as same-sex marriage, if we share our views on Israel and Bible prophecy, or the First and Second Amendments of the Constitution, many people sitting in the pews will get angry. There'll be a mass exodus. They'll leave the church and take their money with them. So only a handful of conservative ministers claim that they're willing to preach on controversial issues. The research team also asked these pastors if they're willing to at least encourage their congregants to become active in the political process. But Barna said their willingness to engage in government was almost nil. So when we talk about the separation of church and state, Churches have, in fact, separated themselves from the activities of the state. And Barna says that's detrimental to everyone when churches aren't willing to get involved. 
In the survey, the pastors were also asked to describe their definitions of success, and their answers were very telling. The five success factors they listed were not the numbers of salvations, healings, answers to prayer, missionaries, and so forth, but their answers were the levels of attendance, financial giving, number of programs, number of staff, and the church's square footage. Well, Jesus didn't die for square footage, nor did he die for attendance numbers, and he certainly didn't die for offerings. Barna is hoping that through his research, pastors and conservative voters can become more active and influential in the issues of the day in the political process. He believes the educational and training levels of pastors must be challenged. You see, in most Bible schools and, schools and seminaries, students aren't taught how to engage churches in the issues. Seminarians are taught to exegete scriptures. They're taught something about the history of the Bible, but they're not prepared to engage the world today. I'm sharing all of this because we need to pray for our Bible schools, our seminaries, and the occupants of our pulpits. Another scandal that I mentioned earlier is the lack of belief in the promises of God. It saddens me how even clergymen try to explain away the promises of God in this word for divine health and miraculous healings. Yes, we're to take up our cross. We're to suffer potentially the loss of all things. But the Lord does promise us his presence and divine health. He promises a supernatural walk of faith through a fallen world. These promises are good for all who can believe. With God's help, I refuse to explain away these glorious promises that daily should give us faith to overcome obstacles. I give glory to God, who according to Ephesians 3.20, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, or according to the power that works within us. That power within us is resurrection power. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. In Ephesians 3.20, Paul uses a double term of excess to explain the superabundance, the absolute infinity of God's power. But how often do you hear believers quoting Ephesians 3.20? He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can even ask or think. May I encourage you never to be afraid to expect great things from God? And our rule should always be to expect great things and attempt great things with the Lord's help. Because without Him, we can't do anything anyway. But exceedingly abundantly above all we can think or ask is a very useful gospel promise. Ephesians 3.20 says we can't think big enough and we can't ask big enough because God's ability and answers are always so much bigger and greater than our finite minds can imagine. God has resources beyond our thoughts. Yet the biggest sin in the church today is the sin of unbelief. God has given us all of these awesome promises and we're not believing him as we should. And on top of that, our faith today, I believe, should be greater now. This is because the prophet Daniel prophesied that in the last days, knowledge shall increase. That's a generalized statement. That means knowledge in all areas should be increasing, including faith. We now have 3D printers that can duplicate incredibly complex things. We have the most amazing nanotechnology as well. So we have miracles and wonders, both large and small, in the technological world. Just as knowledge has increased in technology, I believe Daniel's prophecy should also apply to the realm of faith. Our faith in this Word of God should be greatly increasing in the end times, especially as we see so many Bible prophecies being fulfilled. Why can't we develop enough faith to get ourselves healed according to the many healing promises in this Word of God? Sure, the field of medicine is doing wonders, but should we neglect the supernatural services of a great physician? 
our faith should continually be doing exploits. Jesus said that if two of you on earth will agree about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Many believers go through life defeated because they simply won't believe God. What infirmity are you suffering from right now? Can't the God we serve heal you? Have you ever prayed for God to heal your bladder, your heart, your knee, your aching back? Have you asked him to take away that lump, to dissolve that kidney stone, or whatever is ailing you? Daniel 11.32 says that the people who know God will be strong and do exploits. If our God is the God of Ephesians 3.20, we have to admit that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can even think or ask. I serve the God of Ephesians 3.20. All these years, he's never allowed our ministry to be in debt, and he's kept us alive and going forward because he's an Ephesians 3.20 God of supply, healing, and breakthroughs. He's whatever you need him to be. What's the only limitation on God? It's our unbelief. I say with the Apostle Paul, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus the Messiah, for it is the power of God of God. In finishing today, I want to share a dream about a deadly disease that was attacking a child. And in the dream, the atmosphere in a family home was filled with destructive organisms, a deadly virus. But in the dream, a man of God, a preacher that I know, appeared and he began to pray the prayer of faith in the name of Jesus. And guess what happened? All the organisms in the atmosphere were paralyzed. As soon as the man of God prayed the prayer of faith, the virus stopped moving and died. Then the organisms disintegrated and turned to dust, falling to the ground. I believe that dream is a picture of how the prayer of faith works to overcome sickness and disease. We've simply got to get over this scourge of unbelief, especially as we see the Bible prophecies being fulfilled and all the signs that point to the second coming of Jesus. Why aren't the churches talking about and anticipating the soon coming rule of Jesus during the millennium? With great enthusiasm and anticipation, the Orthodox Jews are saying Messiah is coming. Why aren't the churches saying Jesus is coming? Isn't this what we pray for all the time in the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yet most churchgoers are living like there's no second coming and no millennium. If you ask the average churchgoer, what is the millennium? The thousand year rule of King Messiah. Very few are familiar with the Bible passages about the thousand year rule when Jesus returns to Jerusalem. That's why we must continue to be faithful watchmen upon these walls of Jerusalem. And we watchers can stay in touch through social media and through our website at exploits.tv. In fact, I'd like to invite you to click online to receive our electronic newsletter, Exploits. And at our website, all our previous videos are available for a viewing at any time. And we have news on end time topics and prayer points. You can download also our free Jerusalem Channel app from your favorite app store so you can watch our videos at any time on your mobile phones or tablets. Our app offers daily Bible readings and gives you details of our upcoming events. And so, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem, I'm Christine Darg, Maranatha, and Shalom.